Welcome, this is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and we are um, delighted to have uh, three people here to help us uh, hear more about the final Select Committee report, Select Committee on Higher Education. As, as um, some of us remember, we worked really hard on creating this committee uh, last year, and um, really looking forward to, to hearing uh, thoughts on this report. So I'd like to first uh, welcome Joyce Judy back to committee, um, and please um, provide us your testimony. It's always nice to see you. Thank you, thank you, Chair Webb, and um, thank you to the entire committee for asking us to come back and um, and um, talk with you about our final report. Um, as a, a the way we're thinking about this is, I'll do just a few um, very uh, brief remarks, and then I will ask Brian Prescott, who is um, who has worked so closely with us as um, as a consultant. Um, and he will walk you through some of the changes and talk to you also about um, some actions that this committee might think about in terms of legislative um, um, initiatives um, as we think about uh, the future of public higher ed in Vermont. And then um, Chancellor Zanotny will talk to, share with the group um, the act, all the work that has been going on in the system as a result of the plan. So that's that's our that's our sort of um, thinking. Um, just as a reminder um, to this group, um, our process we um, we we did an RFP and we worked really closely with the Joint Fiscal Office. And I just want to say that it's my it was one of my first experiences working really closely with the Joint Fiscal Office, and I can't um, say enough really good things about them. They worked really closely with us and were a tremendous support. So. Um, just a big thank you to Joint Fiscal and especially Joyce Manchester. She was just inc incredibly invaluable. Um, but as a reminder, um, we had the the um, our committee had three um, deadlines that we needed to meet. One was we needed to produce our first report, our initial report, in December, and then we prepared a second report for early February, and then our third and final report. Um, came to, out to all of you in early April. And I hope you've had a chance to read them. I'm sure you've memorized all almost 200 pages of it, but um, we'll give you a pass if you missed a few pages. Um, but I, I have to say on, as chair of the group, I wanna thank you for your part in helping to put together a really diverse and committed um, committee. Because I think one of the things when you start out as, as a chair of a group of people that you have not worked with before, you oftentimes wonder what is their level of commitment and are they going to attend and all of that. I can say that this group met regularly from September to April and we had nearly perfect attendance at every meeting. And so that says something I think to um, the folks that you assembled, but also to the urgency of the topic and how important it is, it is to Vermonters. I also wanna give a special um, thanks to one member of your committee, Representative James, who was very actively involved. And I will say her counterpart with Senator Baruth was, um, they were just um, really, um, really strong participants. And, um, you know, I've been around long enough to know that this isn't always the case. And so I just really um, wanna thank, um, them both, but especially here today, uh, Representative James, for her willingness to dig in and really ask a lot of thoughtful questions and um, be a really active, active um, participant. Um, I think that um, you know this group. Our intention um, with our reports was to really um, figure out how to set the guardrails for work going forward. And what was important for us is to make sure that we kept at a certain elevation to provide the guardrails, but not get down into the management and making decisions that weren't, that weren't appropriate for our group. And so I think that, I hope you'll see the balance between what Brian shares and then what um, Sophie will share, that it, I think you're gonna find that that work really complements each other and that this, our report was really to provide direction and to provide forward looking in a broad sense, but then allowing the Vermont State Colleges Board of Trustees 
and the colleges to really take that and really um, make it and put it into practice. So I hope you're going to see that this report laid out laid out a plan and that how it's being implemented and that the heart there's a lot of work going on now, particularly also with with the support of the legislature in terms of helping the Vermont State Colleges really chart a path that hopefully will be um, financially sustainable, but also equally important that serves Vermont and Vermonters in a way that is really um, um, important going forward. So will that, with that, I wanna turn this over to Brian Prescott. And again, another thank you there is, you know, we put out an RFP for, um, for a, consult, a consulting firm and the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, you know, was a, put in a really solid proposal. And I have to say, it has been a true pleasure working with them. And I think that um, they would also say that, um, I think they, no, they wouldn't say this, I will say this, that they went above and beyond um, what was expected and what the RFP asked them for, asked us for. And um, it just has been um, amazing. Brian has been in front of many, many different groups in Vermont. I think he also, even though it's been Zoom, I think he feels like he has lived in Vermont just virtually, but he's made himself available. And I think you, he's been here a couple of times and I think you'll agree with me that um, it's been really nice having out, a set of outside eyes look on Vermont's situation and really help us think um, through some things with, through a different lens. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian and um, ask him to sort of walk us through the changes, but also what this committee should be thinking about um, going forward. Thank you very much. And welcome, Brian Prescott. It's nice to see you again. We look forward to hearing your testimony. Thanks very much. And thanks, Joyce, for those kind words, as, as usual. Um, it's been a uh, disappointment that I haven't been able to come to Vermont in person and see you all uh, in three dimensions, but we're doing our best under the circumstances. Um, I am not going to try to talk for too terribly long and, and, and yield uh, most of the time to Sophie and to questions from the committee. But I would start by saying that um, Joyce did me a favor by reminding you all of the timeline that we worked under. So uh, a lot of at, at the select committee's um, encouragement and because we also felt it important to get as much work done as early as possible, uh, what you'll hear from me is that there weren't a ton of uh, major changes to talk through between the report we submitted to the um, Joint Fiscal Office in February and the, and the April one. Um, but I would go back just a step and say um, the, the vision here, the select committee and the work that we did is trying to think about a vision for the Vermont State Colleges and for public higher education in Vermont that not just puts Vermont State Colleges on a financially sustainable path, but also better serves the needs of the state overall as those needs are evolving uh, with time, with demographic changes and so forth. So I think that the, the select committee articulated um, some ideas about how the Vermont State Colleges should become more nimble, should, should, be, uh, should generate more relevant programs, and at the same time that it's that it's putting its financial house in order. So at the end of the day, you get a, a set of institutions that work work for the state better, and also um, under a, a a business model that will will be um, will maintain its um, success in doing so for the time period in the future. So I would just remind folks just that, that uh, referencing my comment earlier, the big picture of the of what we produced in the report this April is not substantively different than what you um, saw in February. There are some changes, I'll articulate them, but the executive summary, the top level things uh, were largely unchanged. There were some, some adjustments here and there, um, but uh, I'll just go through them really quickly that there's no time to waste, that missing in the policy sort of uh, infrastructure in the state is a, is a set of objectives for the Vermont State Colleges and for public higher education. Um, that the Vermont State Colleges clearly need to transform and, and the select committee put forward recommendations uh, as pretty far back that unifying Castleton, NVU and Vermont State, Vermont Tech College, Vermont Technical College into a single accredited institution was a, the strategy that um, seemed the most, uh, that by the, according to the data 
conversations would be the best um, uh, solution possible. And that would include a redesign of educational delivery, new programs and expanded target audiences for the work of the Vermont State Colleges. Um, it would also include important administrative consolidations to achieve greater efficiencies. There is a recommendation um, that you've probably seen and debated at length uh, around strategic funding requirements for um, uh, both for transformation and for ongoing improvements in affordability and capacity. And then finally, that, um, the, that the state consider adopting an affordability standard that um, that really helps the legislature monitor how things are, are going um, around how, how well students are able to afford, especially low and, and, and middle income students are, are able to afford uh, college in Vermont. So there was some new content um, in, the, in the final report that, uh, that relative to the February 12th submission, I'll just uh, quickly outline those. One is that there was a substantial uh, reorganization of the, of the document and uh, particularly around the data exhibits, which we supplemented, but no substantive new findings related to any of that. This was all data that we'd had uh, from earlier, but just needed more time to integrate it um, in a way that told a clearer, I think more straightforward story. Um, a big chunk of the new content was related to implementation steps. So once we got through February and had the recommendations in place, we, we worked with the select committee to identify the entities that needed uh, to think about what, what steps would they be taking in order to pull um, the, the, the whole project across the finish line, as it were. Um, these implementation steps came, we in, included milestone dates for some of them particularly for the Vermont State College Board and Chancellor's Office in order for the legislature to be able to perceive uh, progress towards the goals because this, as we've talked about, is a multi-year process. And those um, milestone dates and, and implementation steps as they relate to the Vermont State College system uh, were closely aligned with the metrics that were negotiated between House of Probes um, and the Vermont State College Board. And I see Representative Fagan has joined us. I know he was involved in those conversations. Um, so uh, there were also some implementation steps for the legislature, and I'll get to that in just a moment, um, but as well as for the governor and, and for the business community. Um, we also uh, uh, returned to the subject of the physical spaces, and we, we felt um, from an external point of view that there was some ambiguity um, in the authority that the Vermont State College Board has to dispose of property, physical spaces. Um, so we, we um, added some language to, to, uh, to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then finally, um, a, a new recommendation was uh, that we recommended that the legislature express its intention to create a requirement that um, financial aid form completion be um, part of high school graduation requirements. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, now for the legislature, um, we identified some things that, that could be helpful for House Ed and the other parts of the legislature to take up as, as this goes forward, in addition to the funding issues that I think have been pretty much, the, rightly so, the focus of a lot of the uh, activity uh, that's happened. Um, I would note that these uh, items are captured in the, sec in the new implementation steps section of the report, and they begin on page 107 of that final report. The first and in some respects most important among them is for the legislature to adopt some policy objectives that will guide funding by the state um, and the, the Vermont State College System Board um, for uh, distributing state funds and, and resource allocation um, generally. Right now, the, the policy objectives are relatively um, missing in, as far as we could tell. And so we, um, we urge the, the legislature to take that up. And I think the last time I was in appear, appearing at this committee, Representative James outlined a strategy for doing that uh, going forward. And, um, and so I, I, I'm expecting that, that that's still part of the discussion. I would just add that there are some ideas that the select committee used as, as, as established some policy objectives and use them to establish criteria for evaluating the recommendations in this report that provide a uh, potentially useful starting point for that discussion. The second item in that section is the 
the need to clarify the authority to dispose of physical property in order to give maximum flexibility to the Vermont State College Board to make effective and efficient use of physical spaces. Um, the, the, the lack of clarity, I think, in here, and uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, but um, I, you know, as we look at it, it, it uh, the, the, the statute gives the, um, the State College Board uh, the authority to own real estate and must protect, preserve, and improve and promote the use of that property, and it may acquire, hold, and dispose of property, but it is not authorized to uh, um, close any institutions. And so there is some question as to the degree to which the the Vermont State College Board may be able to um, to to at at some point dispose of property that is that has uh, debt obligations on it or uh, would, uh, would be like the last piece of property um, on a campus and what to do about the campus site itself. I'm not suggesting that the, that closure is part of the discussion, uh, but I'm just pointing out that there is some ambiguity, I think, in the, in, the, in the statute that the legislature might want to consider taking up and providing uh, the, the State College Board with greater clarity in that regard. Um, the second one is this FAFSA requirement and um, initially, we suggested that the select committee articulate a, re a recommendation that the legislature impose a FAFSA requirement for college uh, or for high school graduation. That is to say, um, in order to graduate high school, uh, high school 12th graders should have completed a um, federal financial aid and state financial aid form. This is a um, thing that is becoming more regular among states. There's there's three that ha have that in place. One, at least one has passed a new FAFSA requirement this um, during this this current session, and um, with the changes to the the simplification of the of the federal financial aid form, at least one of the uh, legitimate major obligations is is weak. Major uh, objections to that gets weakened a little bit. There is some evidence that doing so increases the number of, uh, of students filing FAFSA, learning about college opportunities and ultimately enrolling. Uh, but there's a lot of implementation questions that are, um, are, are in need of being answered. And so we recommended that, uh, or the select committee adopted a recommendation um, in the April report that wasn't there in the February report that the legislature express its intention and encourage uh, a study of how to um, implement a FAFSA requirement uh, in the coming years related to that. And when I say FAFSA, I'm talking about the free application for federal student aid, but I'm also suggesting that the, uh, that the state financial aid form be included in that as well. Um, the, third, the fourth uh, out of five total things I'm gonna mention here is the adoption of the affordability standard and the expectation that the legislature um, require and review monitoring reports around affordability that would be produced by the Vermont uh, Student Aid Commission um, uh, going forward. And, um, and so we are, uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a great deal of detail related to what an affordability standard would look like um, and I can talk more about that if you, if you wish. And then finally, um, an area that we thought was important to raise, uh, but were unable to resolve in the select committee um, was what to do about post-secondary career technical education to adults and adult literacy education programs that exist in Vermont, but are highly uncoordinated across the state. So uh, in 2019, the legislature passed Act 80 which um, authorized a study to examine workforce development investments. Um, and then that, my understanding is that that report got tabled due to COVID and the challenges associated with that. They were very close to signing a contract to have that report done, but ultimately it was um, deemed to be a lower priority than dealing with the crush of cases that came to workforce development around COVID and, and other things. Um, we, we encourage you to, to um, return to that topic. Uh, this is a topic that deserves some, some focused attention. And to the degree that it, um, uh, that it that the legislature takes it up again, I think that the recommendation we made is that it should carefully assess the possible role that the Vermont State College system would play in that arena and with what funding support it would require in order to do that well. 
So those are the things that are new or uh, that's my sort of prepared remarks around what's new in the April um, final report relative to the February report. And I think I'm turning it back over to, well, I'll turn it back over to the chair to determine whether or not we wanna move forward with Sophie or if you have questions for me at this point. Thank you. Um, I'm almost inclined to hear from everybody uh, in, the, in case um, the chancellor answer some of those along the way. So I'll hold question, please, please everybody hold, write them down um, and we'll get to them shortly. So um, welcome back, Chancellor Sadatni. Nice to see you again, as, of course. Thank, thank you for having me back, yes. Um, and today I was just reminded, I just received a delivery of flowers. Today is actually my one year anniversary of um, being appointed as the interim chancellor for a few days. So. Um, I'm here one year later, so, but I do appreciate you having us back. Um, and my understanding is what you're interested in hearing from me is really what the response has been from the Vermont State Colleges uh, to the select committee's work. Um, so again, we're, we're really appreciative of, of all the work that NCHEMS did and the other members of the select committee. We were very happy that the, uh, the recommendations and, and support for the report was unanimous. Uh, I think that was uh, speaks volumes for the work that went on and uh, the recognition of how important the Vermont State Colleges is to the state and the importance of figuring out a path for us moving forward. So um, just to quickly recap where, where we are right now within the system, um, we had five to six weeks of public comment back in, in January into February uh, for people to respond to the initial report that the select committee put out. Uh, we then had a listening session with the board after the, the February report came out, at which the board did receive considerable feedback from a, a wide range of stakeholders, both internal and external. And then there was a, a full board meeting on February 22nd. And at the February 22nd board meeting, our board moved forward with adopting the key recommendations from the Select Committee's February, 20, uh, February report. And again, as, as Brian indicated, the key recommendations have not shifted since that time. So the two primary recommendations were the administrative consolidation system-wide, and then this common accreditation and common leadership for three of the institutions. So Northern Vermont University, Castleton University, and Vermont Technical College. Um, the board recognized that for the transformation that this would entail, for it to succeed, we were going to need to continue to receive the, the recommended funding from the legislature that's set forth in the report, that this is a multi-year process. Uh, also, it would obviously be contingent on NETCHI, uh, the New England Commission on Higher Education, um, our accreditor, approving um, the change, which, you know, we we will be doing going through that substantive change process um, in the next uh, year or so. And also that the, the pandemic um, is somewhat under control, hopefully, and, and everyone gets vaccinated and we can return to something like normal in the fall. You know, we've been in a very strange year um, this past year with, with the way we've been teaching and, and the burdens that that's put on everybody. So we have a number of initiatives um, to support transformation that are already underway. Some of these date back to the, to the fall, um, but I did want to run through all the, the steps that are currently underway. So um, the creation of a single general education core curriculum um, began, that work began in the fall. It's currently working its way through our faculty assemblies. We're cautiously optimistic that that, that will get resolved um, shortly. Um, again, we've got four different faculty assemblies, so it's, you know, we've got to work through the process that we have for faculty governance, but it looks like we're on, on track to get that resolved. Uh, we've also been looking at an expansion of the virtual library that currently exists at the Community College of Vermont and Vermont Technical College and expanding that system wide. Um, there's been some work on that. The decision was made that really to move that forward, we need to hire um, a Vermont State College System Director of Libraries to really re lead that project. And we're in the process of, I think the position has already been posted, but we're moving forward with that. We have a committee of um, folks from uh, across the system, including um, you know, staff and faculty that are involved in the libraries uh, as part of the hiring committee on that. Uh, we also are currently working with an external consultant on evaluating our academic program array. So again, we've got uh, you know, three different institutions 
uh, we have to figure out how to bring them together. Um, there's a lot of duplicate, well, not a lot, but there is some duplication of programs and we need to figure out how to, how to deliver the education we provide in a more efficient way. So we've been working with an external consultant and with our academic leaders. Um, we've been bringing um, the academic leaders, the faculty leaders in to that process. The data has been shared publicly. It's available on our website. Um, faculty leaders have met with the external consultant and there's a town hall meeting happening tomorrow for all faculty um, to participate, ask questions of the external consultants. Um, and then we will be, they'll be preparing a final report that will go to a board committee and then to the, the full board. And then we also um, expect the faculty will be working on this over the summer as well. So we're, we're still in the, the early stages of, of, you know, figuring out exactly what that will look like, but uh, we're getting to, you know, to, to creating the, the, the structure we need for that work to move forward. Um, one of the recommendations that came out of the select committee report was, was um, really the, the importance of having professionalized project management as we move forward. Um, this is an enormous undertaking, and I, I think I realized day by day how enormous it is and, and how it's even more enormous and more complex than perhaps I had thought it was. Um, we are in the process of, of looking for and hiring um, a director of transformation projects. We've had interviews with two finalists this week. Already, we have another one tomorrow. We're anticipating making that decision shortly. Uh, and that I think will really help bring some of that professionalized uh, project management into the transformation work that we're doing. Uh, we're also looking to um, hire a president for the new combined entity. And we will be issuing an RFP um, to retain a search firm to help us with the hiring of a president for this new institution. Um, and that will be happening uh, within the next few weeks. Um, in the meantime, we also have created a number of um, system-wide working groups and cross-function um, working groups. Uh, most of these have been meeting regularly for the past couple of months since the board's decision in February. And some of the areas that are meeting are, are our marketing folks, admissions, development and alumni relations, registrars, financial aid, accounts receivable, workforce development. And there are some other, other groups that are also um, working together um, right now, career services, and then IT working with uh, facilities and public safety um, to think about issues, uh, you know, IT issues related to that. So at this point, the different groups um, are identifying the timelines that must be met in order to obtain the, the common accreditation that we're seeking by July of 2023. They're looking at the sequencing of projects within their particular function areas and then what's going to be involved to align our business processes, policies and procedures as we move forward. So coming out of those groups, uh, we do have an RFP that is going to be going out um, maybe this week, maybe early next week, but looking for um, market research on possibilities for a name for the new combined entity, as well as the, the branding and all the other information that, that you know, to, to create the identity for this new institution. Um, we will be looking at uh, seeking public input on the name. That's obviously going to be a very big issue, a very contentious issue for many people. Um, but we're, again, we're trying to make sure we're involving as many stakeholders as we can with that. Um, our workforce development group, um, they started working together back in the fall when uh, the legislature created the, the workforce initiative using some CARES Act funding. Um, they came together across the system um, to implement that. And they continue to meet after that workforce initiative, which is useful because in um, House uh, Bill uh, 315 that, that just recently passed into law, there was the workforce initiative 2.0 in that. So they're looking for ways to work even more um, seamlessly together, um, a way to streamline the registration system, provide an orientation for applicants. So when they sign up for courses, uh, they're signing up for things that will be most beneficial for them. Uh, and best meet their needs. Um, so they're, they're already moving forward with that. Um, our IT information technology is working on a number of projects, including a unified system-wide help desk, uh, redesigning our portal. Uh, they've also been um, regularly meeting with our data management system vendor to facilitate and redesign and streamline our business processes. Because again, so much of everything is, is driven uh, from the IT end, so we need to make sure that we have IT 
as a, as a really solid foundation for all the work we're doing as we move forward. Uh, one of the other pieces, a strategic financial plan, is something that our Business Affairs Council is working on, and that's scheduled for completion in the fall. Uh, we are also um, constantly working on our communications plan. Uh, we're currently providing updates. We've started doing that every two weeks um, to all faculty, staff, and students. Um, we meet with the senior leadership teams at the colleges very regularly. We have a website um, up that contains all the transformation documents, resources, opportunities for providing feedback. Uh, we've done a series of um, student forums. We have another one next week. Uh, we also have monthly meetings with union leadership just to make sure we're trying to keep everybody uh, on the same page and understanding what we're doing and where we're going. Um, a couple of other recommendations that uh, the select committee had was that the board of trustees um, work with a coach or a consultant to help them, um, you know, get through what will be very, very challenging work moving forward. And so the board has already acquired the services of Jim Page, who was the former chancellor of the University of Maine system, um, who had done a report. Uh, he was an external consultant for the Joint Fiscal Office last summer and had done a report on the Vermont State Colleges. And the board has already started working with Jim Page and has been engaged in a number of development services um, with him, um, a number of development activities, and those are continuing. Um, and then um, the other, one of the other implementation recommendations that was in the select committee report was the board develop um, strategic priorities with metrics. And that was something that the board has undertaken um, and did complete that work actually in the fall um, in developing their strategic priorities and the metrics to be used um, you know, in connection with their strategic priorities. So that's really an update on, on where we are uh, right now um, in response to the work that's been done by the select committee. Um, so again, happy to answer any questions. I do know Representative James had also been interested in uh, what's happening on the Senate side with funding and I'm, I can address that too, but I thought maybe now maybe it'll be more questions in terms of the select committee, the report and the progress that we've made. Thank you. Uh, this is so very much uh, appreciate hearing from all of you. This was something that was very important to our committee last year in making sure that we, we had a voice in, in how you would move forward and um, setting up this select committee. So this is, this is very meaningful to us. Um, there, there's quite a list of things to do um, that I'm looking at. I'm looking at some of the things before the legislature and I understand uh, I just want to check in with our own member who is also on the select committee. Uh, is, is my understanding that you over the you are planning to work on something that uh, to bring for us? Maybe I could ask you and and Representative Fagan um, to help us. We're, we're not prepared to draft that right now. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> so just reaching out to to our members on the select committee. Um, yep, that's that's correct. Um, think that I I see his lips moving. I <laughs> yeah, Representative Fagan and I will be working uh, over the summer to get um, a bill together and get everything kind of neatly packaged and um, brought to the legislature for next session. Peter, nod your head if you. Good, excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Driving down to Manchester is easy. There's okay. a couple of bellies down there that are my favorite places in the world. Sounds good. So we'll be taking a look at all the um, all the recommendations and sort of marching orders for the legislature um, that begin on. If anyone's curious, they start on page 107 of the final copy of the report. And um, those are the things we'll need to take a look at and um, get into uh, legislative form. So I think that's going to be a great project. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Right. And it might be helpful to include someone from the uh, uh, Commerce and Economic Development Committee as well, as they have spent significant time on, on workforce. And I know I was, hearing, I was hearing about Act 80 and um, how that got stymied. And I, I just wanted to check with Representative Jerome. Do you know, is there further progress in that area at this point or is it? I, I know it was, it was put on hold and um, we have asked that it be completed. Okay, great. I think it's in some legislation that we've that we've asked that it 
it be finished. Thank you. Um, Representative Austin. Yep. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm just looking over right now uh, the fact sheet for the American Jobs Plan that is coming down from President Biden. And um, looks like there, I mean, there's just oodles of money coming for workforce development, um, post-secondary education, um, paying for colleges, $38 billion. This is nationally for um, workforce development. I, I just hope when you're, again, I think it's a new context that we're now looking at maybe some of these recommendations in terms of funding or workforce. So if you, you know, I just hope over the summer, Representative James, you know, that when this does, uh, you know, when it becomes the guidelines and everything become clearer, you can kind of look at what the goals are and look at what funding possibilities there are. There's a lot of um, uh, possibilities for workforce development and certification in construction, transportation, caregiving, manufacturing, clean energy. So it'd be just wonderful if the colleges, I mean, I, I just, you know, it's very simple to me to just say if the college is just kind of aligned with some of that, those, uh, you know, the uh, workforce uh, options, it, it just seems like it's a, it would be a good match. I'm, but I, I'm, I know it's much more complex than that, but I just hope that that will be taken into consideration. I'm going to just check in. I'm assuming Joyce, Judy, and Sophie, you are well aware and working on, on what could Absolutely. be coming forward. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I will certainly be paying attention and keeping fingers crossed that it makes it, uh, yeah, the legislation moves forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be, could be a real gift to help us through this transition. And um, uh, Representative Fagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I've, I've got to go vote on another bill. I'll just make this short. One of the interesting things about governmental accounting is that almost after the fact, we can swap funds out. In other words, if the if this bill, uh, if, you know, I, I was listening last night and when he said talking about the Pell Grant, for example, it sounded like doubling it. Um, doubling of, of the Pell Grant would uh, would make, um, you know, would make um CCV, I'll just use CCV as an example, uh, probably free for most students whose families are in the $75,000, $80,000 a year area. Don't need to be explicit now, but the point I want to make is this. Uh, so funding that we might provide to, to CCV, to the state colleges and CCV using general fund, for example, um, we can back that out. Um, and and uh, and insert the federal funds when the federal funds become available. Actually, we, federal funds wouldn't flow through us; they would flow through Department of Education. But because those funds are applied to the institution and the the general funds are no longer necessary for that purpose, we can back the general funds out. So, like I said, the uh, the the person, like I've said in the past, the person who invented governmental accounting probably was a uh, you know was just a brilliant, but might have been a little. Uh, might, might have tried to play a joke on all of us and we're still putting up with it. So I got to go vote on another bill, not not education, but uh, another bill. So I'll be right back in. And if you're still here, great. That's I'll really turn good my video know. off and do this. That's Thank really you. good to know, Representative Fagan. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there other questions for other people that are in our committee? Representative James. Um, Brian, there's, there's Brian. Um, Brian, I think um, it might be interesting for folks on the committee to learn just a little bit more about the affordability standard. I, I know as a select committee member, that was a new concept to me, and I, I think it's really interesting. Sure, uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, the, uh, the idea behind the affordability standard is that there, that in most states, and I would put Vermont in this, in this bucket as well, um, affordability is sort of in the eye of the beholder. And if there's any consensus about affordability, it's generally that it's, there isn't any colleges unaffordable and it's getting worse. Um, but there isn't, a, there, there isn't a very straightforward set of metrics around which to, uh, to equip legislators as they're making resource allocation decisions, um, how to, how to think about affordability. And often 
uh, the students themselves, uh, as, as vocal and as powerful a voice as they may have, they don't have the resources that, that institutions often do in the legislature to talk about the needs of the institution. And ultimately, we want to make sure that, that the combination of funding patterns leads to affordability. So the affordability standard that we like to use relies on primarily on current income and funds that, that students and their families have and accounts for all of their costs of attendance, including living, books and supplies, um, and you know, sometimes transportation expenses as well. Um, and then uh, the, the core of the standard is that students uh, ought to be able to afford their full costs of attendance by working um, an amount of time that does not that is not so onerous that it distracts from their progress in re reaching their educational aspirations. So for a full-time student, we tend to think of that as about 15 hours a week throughout the entire year, um, 48 weeks a year. Another way to think about it is 10 hours a week during the, during the nine-month academic year and full-time during the summer um, at, at the uh, prevailing minimum wage. And then all of the other uh, costs associated with enrollment would, um, need to, would need to add up to the cost of enrollment. They, they won't. But the degree to which the, that gap remains is a better measure of unmet need than the current uh, practice that we've done. And it allows for, and, and, and the other piece of this that, that I think it's important to reflect on is that because the, the next thing after the student work contribution sets the amount that a student self-help component should be able to account for, the family's contribution, the parent, if, for a dependent student, the parent contribution is next. That creates progressive uh, 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 picture of, of funding, and then all state, federal, and institutional grants are accounted for. The, the remainder is what's left over that must be funded somehow. Oftentimes, students take out loans to get that. Uh, sometimes they work two, two jobs, or they work 40 hours a week while they're trying to enroll, be enrolled um, in order to cover the, those gaps. And we uh, believe that uh, uh, that, that's, that states who, who use this sort of very straightforward practical approach to calculating what that what that gap is will be better equipped to think about how for students at different income levels will be better equipped to think about how to allocate resources to the institutions that most serve them and to the to the financial aid programs that that really target the populations most in need um, they're, they're better able to do that than they than they would be in the absence of that kind of information and so we we've articulated the, an affordability standard in the report and urge the legislature to use it consistently year over year to evaluate how well that's working for Vermont residents. Thank you. Good question. Any, anyone else? Stephanie, Stephanie Drew, I'm Representative Drew. Uh, thank you, Chair. Is it appropriate that I ask a question, even though I'm not a member of the committee? You are you are invited to participate. Uh, you are a member. <laughs> thank you. So I would just like to hear a little bit more from uh, Brian on the uh, plan of folding in the adult career technical education um, infrastructure within the Vermont State College system. And this is something we've been talking about for a long time in our committee, and um, I'd like to hear your perspective. Uh, so in 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 working on that project uh, or that part of the part of the project, we, um, from an external point of view, uh, saw that Vermont has an unusually um, distributed, I will say, approach to trying to deal with the uh, career technical education programs in the state, particularly for the adult populations. Um, and by, by distributed, I mean that, that each of these 17 area centers has some portion of it but there isn't any, there's not a lot of data to allow us to understand how much of that activity is happening and what kinds of programs and, uh, and, and courses is that happening? Are they meeting statewide or local needs or are they responding to tuition paying, uh, you know, uh, students who need things that they're, they're more interested in uh, rather than what would be helpful to the populations who can't who can't afford tuition but need actual skills that can that can translate into jobs that are productive in the economy. So we um, identified that problem. We talked with members of the select committee about how best to address it. But because the legislature or the, the state has made commitments around um, workforce development activities 
in a variety of different uh, ways. Um, we ultimately uh, did not make a recommendation as precisely how the Vermont State Colleges should go about engaging in that uh, topic, but rather that it des this deserves some significant study. And it because the way in which this stuff happens, what's missing is a, is a dedicated funding stream to ensure that it actually does meet the kind of needs that the, that the local communities and the local and the state have for um, that kind of programming. Thank you, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, good, good question. Anyone else? We will, I have to say that I ha hadn't quite gotten to page 107, but glad to know that that's a place that I should start it. <laughs> um, Can you and, start there? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think that is probably the best place to start right now, and go, then go backwards. Um, but I'm pleased that there'll be more work over the summer to figure out how uh, we, we can move forward with the legislation, our part in this process. And I'm sure we will be wanting to hear back from you in January as we move forward. I, I would add for those that studied the, um, either the initial report or the February report on the Joint Fiscal Office website is a red line version mm -hmm. of the final report. So again, if you know, if you're short on time, that's a sort of quick way to see what changed between the February report and the and the final report. Thank this you. a long report. <laughs> that is helpful. Having having actually fully read the other one. <laughs> okay, I think we can break then. Very much appreciated this update. Thank Thanks you so much. much for your support, and especially Chair Webb and Representative James, because um, this is really important work for Vermont. So um, thank you. It certainly is. And good, good luck to all of you. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much for your thank work. You, Brian. Brian, Thanks, thank Brian. You. Okay. I think um, we can break. I don't have anything for us this afternoon. I have word that both of the bills that were in appropriations have passed out 11-0. Yay. So that should be then on the notice calendar tomorrow and on the floor on Tuesday. So uh, really, thank you so much for your work and appropriations on that. I'm sorry we don't have um, Representative Brady here because we hear that she just set a new standard for bill presentation up at appropriations. I, I, Madam Chair, yes, she did. She is extraordinarily knowledgeable about the bill that she would, she would be reporting. We asked for a high level overview. Actually, she figured that we would want a high level overview. She did a wonderful job, and uh, and then we we talked about the uh, the uh, you know the appropriations that the single appropriation that is embedded in it, but why it's important.